Video games. A staple in today's culture as one of our main sources of entertainment. Many people have shared and bonded memories over video games, whether they are across the globe or sitting on the same couch. As such a big industry as it is today, it's no surprise many people know at least a thing or two about some form of gaming. I mean, who isn't familiar with such mascots like the Mario Brothers, Sonic the Hedgehog, Pac-Man the Drug Addict, Gex the... uh... Gecko. Now, most of the world is familiar with these faces, but they haven't been around forever. Heck, Mario just turned 35 two years ago. As such a big part of our culture today, it's only natural to talk about the origins. So, let's get ready as we dive into the history of the video game. Back before we had electric machines, we had this thing, the Abacus used for simple arithmetics like adding and subtracting and keeping count of big numbers. You could kind of consider it the first computer. It was inventions like this that inspired the need for automation in math as the math got more and more complicated. More counting devices would keep being invented, but it wasn't until 1613 that the word computer would first be used. The term computer actually used to refer to a person, as in they computed calculations. All the way back in the 1600s, being a human calculator was an actual job, but it wasn't until 1822 that a computer would refer to a machine. Charles Babbage would be the first to invent a mechanical computer. It was called the differential machine and it could process polynomial equations. You know, these. A few more computers would be invented that were essentially really large calculators. However, the first completed, programmable, electromechanical computer was the Z1, finished sometime in 1938 by Konrad Zuss, a German engineer. Oh boy, oh let me tell you, this bad boy can handle at least two calculations a minute. <laughs> if that ain't something, I don't know what is. Now of course, that isn't much by today's standards, but back then, that was impressive. But humans wouldn't use these computers for entertainment much until 1958, when a physicist named William Higginbotham conceptualized the first true video game. It was a tennis game called Tennis for Two, a game very reminiscent of Pong that had visuals through an oscilloscope. It was the first step of many more to come. Even though William created the first video game, Ralph Baer is credited as the father of video games for his work in the area. Born in Germany on March 8, 1922, Bayer and his family moved to America in 1938 to escape Nazi control. He was mostly self-taught from working in a factory and eventually graduated from the American Television Institute of Technology with a bachelor's degree in television engineering. Bayer soon joined Sanders Associates, a defense contractor, where he would oversee engineers developing tools and machines for military use. But in his spare hours, Bear would think about using electronics as a mean of entertainment. He wondered if it was possible to use television screens to display interactive games that could be played remotely from a controller. He gathered a team and started development in the late 1960s. And finally, in 1968, Bear and his associates would develop the Brown Box as the first commercially available home console. It would contain a small assortment of games like ping pong and checkers. Eventually, the console was licensed to a company called Magnavox, who mass-produced the now-called Magnavox Odyssey. Word of a video game box spread quickly, and soon enough other companies would begin to take action and join the console industry. And so began the long line of gaming to come. We've already talked about the creation of the first-gen video game console, but of course, it's only the start. More and more consoles from new competitors would get into the business in the late 70s, but home gaming was only a part of the origin of video games. We haven't talked about arcades yet, baby! Why play in the comfort of your own home when you could go to a building that's super dark and all the controls are smeared with, like, grease from multiple sweaty hands? Ugh. Well, they aren't extremely popular now, but arcades were a huge hit back in the late 70s. 
And it was around this time that many big companies started to get involved, like Atari, Taito, and Konami, and even some faces still in the game today like Nintendo and Namco. Now, I won't be going over the history of the arcade entirely because video games were a late addition, so just know it started with mainly pinball machines and some other mechanical games until 1971, when video game arcade machines were introduced. The first was Computer Space, a shoot 'em up developed by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, who are also the founders of Atari. Kinda cool. Most games started like this, but as time went on, graphics, music, and machines themselves evolved. Enter the golden age of the arcade, with new games introduced and progressively getting better over the years. Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Centipede, Galaga, Breakout, Asteroids, all great, awesome games that made their way into many Americans' hearts. At this point in time, Atari and Nintendo have already made some home consoles, but they really boosted into popularity with arcade hits like Donkey Kong and Pong. Also, on a side note, Magnavox actually sued Atari 1977 because Pong was very similar to their ping pong game and they actually won. It's a little bit interesting to think one of the biggest classics out there is sort of a knockoff. Soon, consoles started to gain some traction again, but it wouldn't last for very long. Microchips were recently developed, which in turn helped the creation of the home computer, which was released to the general public. They saw a rise in 1982 with new competitors like Commodore International and Texas Instruments. Yes, the calculator company. Engaging in a price war that dropped home computer prices to lower than video game console ones. And soon enough, in 1983, the video game market just absolutely crashed. Just gone. <laughs> no joke. The total revenue dropped from 3.2 billion in 1983 to less than 100 million in 1985. For comparison, here's what that actually looks like. Just this. That's all that's left. And remember, this is the total video game revenue for all companies. No one even actually made this much. Things would also start to pick up in the late 80s. Well, at least for some companies. Atari, the dominating company in the 70s, was just totally out of the race by now, after multiple failed consoles and games, including the absolutely horrid E.T. game. Yikes. You know, it was actually so bad that many unsold copies of the game are just buried in the deserts of New Mexico. Anyway, in 1985, Nintendo released the NES to an American consumers. Known as the Famicom in Japan, short for family computer, this console was very groundbreaking for its time as it helped recover the video game industry after the crash. Nintendo wasn't the only big dog in the world of gaming at this point. Sega began to see a rise in popularity and started to take on Nintendo in their campaigning, and soon began one of the most legendary mascot wars in history. There's been a few console wars in the past, and one still going on today, but I'm only going to go in depth to the rivalry between Sega and Nintendo because I think it's the most interesting. Today we have the big three, Sony, Xbox, and Nintendo, but Sony and Xbox are younger than Nintendo and Sega, and their feud is not as complex as, you know, the plumber and the hedgehogs. So let's take a trip back to the 80s and see what happened. Nintendo started up again in 1985 with their new console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES for short. With NES favorites like Super Mario Bros, Nintendo quickly picked up the pace and began to work their way back into success. Sega, on the other hand, was not doing as well. They started successfully in the arcade world but faced difficulty in selling their consoles. Starting out relatively poorly in the Japanese market, Sega would open to the American market with the Sega Master System in 1986, then with the Sega Genesis in 1989. Unfortunately, both were quickly overshadowed by the release of new Nintendo games, like Super Mario Bros. 3. Sega decided they needed a more competitive approach, and realized they also needed a mascot. The big face in Nintendo is Mario, the Mamma Mia man, the lovable red plumber that takes shrooms and jumps on turtles. Sega saw that and said, hey, we can do better. So, to compete with a mascot of this caliber, Sega ultimately formed a new mascot. A cooler, faster competitor meant to reflect the attitude of teens of the time. You already know who I'm talking about. Sonic. 
Okay, he may not be much now, but when Sonic first dropped in 1991 on the Genesis, it took off almost instantly. The Genesis was a 16-bit console, but it was actually made to compete with the 8-bit NES, even though the 16-bit Super NES released a year earlier. Even though Sonic was just doing fantastic at the time, Sega decided it wasn't as good as Mario was doing. So, their obvious solution was to become more aggressive in their advertising. Ads with comparisons between the Genesis and the NES were very, very forward in explaining how much better the Genesis was. They really started to dominate as more and more fans began to get into Sega, but it kind of backfired too. Some thought their approach was way too harsh, like just take a look at these for example. Montana free, Pat Riley free, Buster Douglas free, Super Monaco GP free, or Collins free. What Nintendo buy a 16-bit Genesis system between now and October 31st. Yeah, no wonder some people felt they shouldn't support Sega. With many famous slogans and quotes like Genesis does what Nintendo don't and blast processing, Sega quickly gained a much stronger following. The ads were so relevant it stuck in a lot of people's minds. The song playing in the background right now is actually based off of one of the ads. Have a listen. Genesis has blast processing. Super Nintendo does it. So what's blast processing do? Uh, what if you don't have blast processing? Again, my point being, these ads were so aggressive and catchy that they were embedded into the minds of many people. Now with the aggressive marketing, Sega began to do better than Mario in the 1990s. And for good reason too, these games were badass. Wow, look at him go. Even with the recent success Sega was seeing, things would soon change forever with the first E3 in 1995. It would be here in E3 that the war would have a victor. E3, or the Electronic Entertainment Expo, was created in 1995 by Pat Farrell to have a demonstration show specifically made for video games. Nintendo and Sega announced they would demonstrate the new consoles and games, and well, it was interesting to say the least. As far as consoles go, Nintendo announced the Nintendo 64. Named after its 64-bit CPU, it was a console that could finally support fully 3D games. Sega, on the other hand, would announce their latest console, the Sega Saturn, which was still pretty good, but not as great as Nintendo's N64. In the end, there was obviously still a winner, but who could it be? Of course, I'm obviously talking about Sony. Sony's reveal of the PlayStation 2 outclassed Nintendo and Sega in quality, games, and also price. It totally put an abrupt stop to the feud between Nintendo and Sega as Sony began to dominate the console market. They're still in first place today.